what's funny is I feel like it's evolved as I've learned more about the profession. So honestly, in the beginning, it was maybe a simple explanation of, well, I want to help people. I really love the healthcare field. Um, and I was an athletic person kind of my whole life. So, um, my mom, uh, was a x-ray technologist for an orthopedic surgeon. And so her office was right by physical therapy. And, um, I would shadow sometimes and get to see what they would do. And just as I got to see what physical therapy was and all of the different settings and things that the profession does, it just really, really spoke to me. I love, I love movement. I love working with people. And I love that physical therapy is really just teaching somebody how to move better and that you can use your own body to heal itself. Did you know that we each lose a different amount of electrolytes in our sweat, largely based on our genetics? That means that there's no one size fits all perfect sports drink for everybody because we each have unique needs. That's why we at Solpre developed the Sync Hydration System, a series of sports drinks to help match you with the personal level of electrolytes that you need. If you'd like us to help you match with your perfect sports drink, go to solpre.com slash hydration dash quiz. That's solpre.com slash hydration dash quiz. Welcome to the Smart Athlete Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Funk. My guest today is a distance runner after my heart. Always love having a distance runner on. Also a cyclist. Uh, she has her doctorate of physical therapy. And uh, most importantly, which we're saving for last, she was a winner of a Michael Jackson moonwalking competition back in 2014. So uh, that's definitely the you know going to be the entirety of the podcast today. We're just going to talk about Michael Jackson. You can find her on Instagram at boulder underscore sports underscore physio. Welcome to the show, Dr. Sarah Zimmer. Jesse, thank you so much for having me and for the wonderful intro. Um, yeah. I always love when people highlight my my dance moves. For some reason, I don't. I keep that semi private when it comes out. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I feel like you know. There. Okay, so you live in Boulder. And so to to be clear, uh, for for people with the Instagram, it is Boulder, as in. Uh, the city, not bolder, as in she's bolder than other people. Um, <laughs> Except although that may also be true, mm -hmm. uh, but, but for spelling purposes. Uh, so, I mean, okay, so you live in Boulder, and I, I mean, I've, it seems like everybody I talk to lately lives in Boulder. So, I, I feel <laughs> like maybe I should just move out there and we can just do all these podcasts in person. But, you know, Boulder is full of very active people, lots of runners, lots of endurance and athletes, trail runners, ultra runners, cyclists, all these kind of things. So, I, I mean, I think if you think about from a branding standpoint, you go, okay, yeah, I'm a runner and I've got my doctor of physical therapy and I, I do all these things, but what do I have that other people don't have? I won that Michael Jackson competition. <laughs> I should make this my calling card. Like, it, you know, you should like do the whole, you know, dress up like Michael, like do the poses, uh, have the silhouette on your business card. Like, I, I think you should go all in. That's brilliant. I should have niched in like moonwalkers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like very specific injuries that nobody else knows how to treat. Cause they're like, how did you, like, what kind of moves did you do to, to get these injuries? And then you're like, oh yeah, you were trying to do the lean over thing, but your shoes weren't attached to the floor and you fell and cracked your head. Like, Totally. You know, there's, there's quite a lot of uh, crossover too, because to moonwalk, you need good ankle mobility. Mm -hmm. You need stable hips. So there's a, there's a lot of crossover. I could use some of the same videos. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You, what do you think if, if I just say uh, goodbye to my current companies and I just open a marketing agency, do you think I have a chance at helping rebrand people and really taking them to the next level? Oh my gosh. I'm sold. I'm sold. <laughs> you didn't create a business of me, uh, listening to Michael Jackson and teaching moonwalking. I'm sold, <laughs> but I also love what I currently do. <laughs> yes. Uh, unfortunately I would guess that, uh, the time for that has passed, even, uh, though the King of pop will probably remain the King of pop. Oh, um, the, yeah. the, you know, we have Gen Z now who I don't know how aware of Michael Jackson they are or not. So 
uh, maybe a little bit tougher. Uh, but I guess if you're after the demographic, it's going to be uh, Gen X, maybe boomers, and then millennials. Everybody's getting older. You start teaching them those dance moves, then you can bring in the physical therapy component when they eventually hurt themselves because they weren't in shape to be doing the dance moves. <laughs> this whole new endurance sport to Boulder that I'll bring. Moonwalking. Changing the culture. Uh-huh. <laughs> so uh, on a more serious note, um, I would like to ask, like, it's kind of a broad, but how did you get to where you are? <laughs> um, meaning you know, not, not, well, my parents met in 1985, not, not that, you know, not that far back, but just like, um, you know, why go into to physical therapy? You know, what, what, what's the driver? Was it just like, and hey, that looks cool. We'll try it out. Like, is it as just as simple as that? No, that's a really good question. And what's funny is I feel like it's evolved as I've learned more about the profession. So honestly, in the beginning, it was maybe a simple explanation of, well, I want to help people. I really love the healthcare field. Um, and I was an athletic person kind of my whole life. So um, my mom uh, was a x-ray technologist for an orthopedic surgeon. And so her office was right by physical therapy. And um, I would shadow sometimes and get to see what they would do. And just as I got to see what physical therapy was and all of the different settings and things that the profession does. It just really, really spoke to me. I love, I love movement. I love working with people. And I love that physical therapy is really just teaching somebody how to move better and that you can use your own body to heal itself um, and stay active long time. You can, you know, get rid of chronic pain. You can avoid surgery. You can do all these amazing things by just learning how to move correctly and finding what form of movement um, works for you and that you love. So uh, I've just have really loved that. And then of course I moved to Colorado. Um, I grew up in Wisconsin and went to school in Wisconsin, but moved to Colorado after I graduated from PT school. Uh, and since moving out here, I like knew I wanted to be in the sports setting, but really wasn't sure what that meant. And then about three years ago, I started my private practice, uh, Boulder Sports Physio, um, and have just really niched in uh, the athletic population, which funnily enough is like the entirety of Boulder. Like I tell every single person that they're an athlete, um, no matter what, because everyone's just so active, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, but it's been really, really fun. And I've just found this really fun passion in working with athletes and getting, helping people to like, continue to do what they love to do and continue to push themselves in ways they never thought they could, which is so rewarding. One of the things you're talking about, um, I, I always think is fascinating. And I, I'm kind of curious if you have any, like, as I ask you this, if there's any like client stories that kind of stick out to you. Um, but thinking about like, like reteaching people biomechanics or like how to activate muscles they haven't been using. I, you know, I've gone through a little bit of that this last year as I, you know, here sitting in the chair doing all these podcasts, like, you know, lack of activating my glutes while I'm running, which led to problems. Um, you know, you like, it's something you take for granted. It's like, I've been running for 20 years. You would think, oh, I wouldn't have any problems, but just, you know, nowadays too much sitting basically. Um, and I also think about like my friend who, she had a very competitive athlete um, and she just had so many biomechanical problems. Like I know she basically had to build from the ground up, like relearning how to walk and just, I mean, she wasn't like paralyzed or anything, but the way she was moving caused so many injuries and pain, like chronic pain that like she literally had to start over. They like, I can't, I don't know all what was involved, but she was flying across the country to see specialists and all kinds of things. Um, she wore like this adjustment for her, her jaw that helped align just wow. lots. Um, but it, it, you know, changed the way she moved and then changed her ability to be consistently active because of, you know, reteaching all those things. And this isn't a slight to her or to myself or to anybody, but on the one hand, I think about like how we're so 
you know, dumb, quote unquote, that we like can't move our own body, but then like also can, like we can, you know, make the, remake those connections or make those connections for the first time and learn how to activate things like in the kind of more proper pattern. So I'm just curious, if there's any stories or, or thoughts you have in that direction that kind of stick out to you? Yeah. I mean, man, there's, there's quite a few. I feel like that's most of, most of what I do. I, what's, interesting about the human body. And I think this is true for everybody, but specifically for athletes is that the human body is like so smart. So it will keep moving if it has to, and not necessarily in the best ways all the time, but it will find compensations. It will find new routes. It will create new motor patterns to do whatever it is that you need it to do. Um, and unfortunately when that happens and when it happens for such a long time, it, um, it's a harder habit to break out of. Um, and it normally, it, it leads to injury or sometimes chronic injury, uh, which is unfortunate. So, um, I have, yeah, I have so many stories where, uh, you know, the person maybe went to a different clinic or went somewhere else. Um, and, uh, they were treated for where the pain was. So they had Achilles tendonitis. And so they were just treated for that. They kind of were just looked at as a diagnosis instead of as a person, um, and so maybe some of it worked initially, but uh, didn't quite get them the full 100%. And I think um, the stories I can think of for patients is that maybe came in with that is as I start to listen to them and listen to their story, I start to find out like, oh, okay, yes, you have this Achilles tendonitis, but you also um, had like a bike accident. You fell on your hip a few years ago. And as a kid, you got bucked off a horse. And um, I don't know, that's a weird one, but, um, but it happens. And like all these little things like, oh, okay, you've just be cre been creating these bad motor patterns for a while now. It's not just about your Achilles anymore. It's about like everything that we're having to unravel and fix um, and addressing all those little pieces uh, so that your whole system moves appropriately and the Achilles tendonitis goes away. Um, if that answers your question, I, I feel like I actually do that a lot, which is the part of my job that I love. Like I love the, I have to be a detective and pick out all the clues and um, everyone's story and putting all the pieces together like a puzzle and, oh, okay, that's why this is happening. Let's make sure we address all of these pieces, which sometimes can make it seem like the process is a little overwhelming or takes a little bit longer, um, which I'm hoping it doesn't feel overwhelming to people, but once you explain the full picture, it kind of makes sense. And people understand like, oh, okay. That's why I have to strengthen my glutes for my heel pain to go mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I, I actually went through that where I was like, I was having pain presenting on my left glute. You know, I had like glute medius issues kind of before that I'd worked through. So I went in saw someone, we kind of worked on that, that went away, then the right side started hurting. And it was like, we got that glute going, but then the like Achilles tendon was a problem and the hamstring was a problem. And it's like, we basically like worked our way back around the chain from like probably the source of the problem being, um, you know, the lack of glute activation leading to the Achilles tendonitis or tendinosis at this point. And then that causing the overcompensations back the other direction, which was stronger, it getting weaker, pain that you know so it's like it in theory it's it's nice to go like like you know when I do the running show and people ask questions or I do video on like how to deal with this particular injury it's like well we can talk about you know what the you know prescription is for this particular you know muscle or movement or tendon or whatever like these are the exercises but I do try to mention that like it's a system and there are you know and I'm not qualified you are to, to help diagnose people and, and really work through the entirety of the system and chain and all the the problems that can crop up um and luckily there's more people kind of looking at us holistically instead of just in in isolation um because when we go out and run or when we swim or bike or go lift weights or whatever like it's all compound movements we're not just like you know, doing a, a calf raise or doing like a bicep curl. Like it's not, a, it's not a single, single muscle focus. So um, I, I think I'm talking to a couple of different um, 
PT people the last last couple of weeks. And I think one of the challenges you face, and maybe you can talk more about if you have a, a general prescription, is how to appropriately continue to load people. So like maybe you work in isolation to begin with, but like the loads and stress that you put on your body when you're running is different than like in my case, I'm still working through the end of my progression for the tendinosis of doing like eccentric calf drops with weight, which is good, but just like the amount of load while I'm running is very different than that kind of activity. So how, not necessarily for my case in particular, but just in general, do you have a kind of framework you work with in trying to move people from isolation to like full motion? Yeah. Yeah. I love that question. Um, I do have, I do have a general kind of, um, plan or protocol, if you will, for a lot of these different things, but, uh, of course it does like depend on the person and what they tolerate, what their sport is and where it's coming from. And yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so a lot of the times it's, gosh, it's really that I only am doing like isolation at first, like there, there maybe is a little bit of that and, and more so the purpose of the isolation is just to bring the person's awareness back to that muscle. Um, so to make that brain body connection of like, okay, like this is the muscle I'm talking about. This is, can you feel it? Do you know what it feels like when you activate it? Okay. That is the purpose of this isolation exercise. I feel like, um, one that comes to mind is clamshells. Like I feel like in the past few years, clamshells are, are being hated on is like, duh, clamshell, it's such a dumb exercise. But I do use it from time to time for that, like, okay, I, I want you to feel like your glute muscles. Yeah. Them. Um, and sometimes you have to do that in a clamshell. Okay. And the various, like the different variations of a clamshell. So you get all aspects of your glute. Okay, great. You can feel it. Let's see if you can maintain that. And now putting it in a more functional position, like maybe a bridge or maybe a, a standing exercise, like a, like a fire hydrant. It's, it's, okay, okay, I can feel that. I can see how it's supporting my foot. Um, like I'll do exercises in standing with people. Okay, now you you can feel that glute muscle. Now let's see if you can feel it while also creating foot stability. So you're lifting your arch, um, your balance, you're grounding through your big toe. Can you also feel how that requires glute activation? So I'll do exercises like that. And people can see like, oh, yes, when I activate my glute, my foot is, my arch is stable or whatever. Um, so it's like that, um, but to, to go on your point, especially with tendon related things, uh, depending on how like severe it is, um, maybe not so much isolation, but a lot of like isometric. So, um, just getting a lot of blood flow to the area. So for Achilles tendonitis or sometimes, um, patellar tendonitis at the knee, I'll give people just like isometric exercises, meaning, um, like for Achilles, you stand on your heel. So you kind of go up into a calf raise, but you stay there so that you activate your calf, but you're not putting your ankle through that range of motion. So you're not uh, irritating the Achilles per se, but you're getting a lot of blood flow. You're activating that muscle. Um, that's a great way to kind of start somebody somewhere. Um, and then, you know, you go into the eccentrics because the point of an eccentric is trying to, um, yes, yeah, strengthen the muscle, but you're trying to realign all of the tissues because a lot of these itises there's an inflammatory response but there's also like um a degenerative response if you will like there's micro tears there's breakdown and so the point of an eccentric is loading the muscle but in a way that realigns the tissues so that they're all uniform um, and can work together and then once it feels good and it's strong in that okay now we go to functional movement patterns so now let's load it um, eccentrically while landing. Cause that's a lot of people's problems. So like maybe you're stepping off of a step and you're landing on it. Okay. Now that feels good. Maybe we can start some plyometrics. Um, and not to say that, that you can't do all of those things in one session, but that's kind of the general protocol that, that I follow. Um, and trying to add weight to it too, especially for runners. I think, uh, runners are starting to dabble in strength training, which is awesome. Um, and how that looks is different for everybody, but mm -hmm. at some point, like running is a plyometric exercise and you put like two to three times your body weight, at least with every step, um, into your body. So if you're only doing body weight strength training, that's awesome. That's a great place to start. But at some point you need to load those tendons and ligaments and tissues with 
more weight because that's what you're doing when you're running is doing two to three times your body weight through that tissue. I think, um, so if, if you, the listener have any kind of tendon problems, I think part of the difference, uh, with that is that it, the uh, adaptation time is so much longer than like mm-hmm. muscle rehab. It can be, uh, frustrating if you haven't done it before. Um, I know I haven't really had tendon issues prior to this and, um, this has been, this has been a long one. So I started rehab back in like December, I think it was race probably a little bit too early, blew it up and then had to start over. Um, Cause I was, you know, I was, I was basically like had gotten, I hadn't finished through the whole, uh, progression, but then I was like able to be at the track, do speed work, pain free, all that kind of stuff. And I did this race and just was not good. (laughs) Well, it's not good, but, um, so now we, you know, I'm going to learn my lesson, I guess. Um, so <laughs> it, it, no judgment. PTs make those decisions too, sometimes. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, eh, it, it, it just is, what yeah, it is. but, um, give me more time to do more podcasts and, and work on the business <laughs> more. Um, I'm not running as much. Um, so I did want to ask you about, so like one of the things I was introduced to, and I, I think you're certified in this as well as a number of other things I kind of wanted to ask you about what I'll call like unusual um, therapies or techniques, things that maybe people haven't heard of like Graston, um, which is what I was introduced introduced to. I go see a gentleman every two weeks now uh, to have him scrape my uh, (laughs) uh, ankle basically, which is a fun exercise. Um, But you always feel better afterwards. So, Uh, so I guess I wanted to ask a little bit about that. Just some of the things that, maybe people have like heard in passing, but if they haven't seen somebody like you, maybe you just don't know that's available. Um, and then I, as a two-parter, um, because I know like if I wanted to, I could like go on Amazon and buy muscle scraping stuff. Uh, can you talk to why maybe that's not the best idea? <laughs> I guess, I guess, unless you disagree, but um... I've heard it's maybe not the best idea. So. <laughs> No, I appreciate that question. Um, well, first, first I'll answer kind of what that is or, you know, like the different types of treatments maybe. Um, I think a lot of physical therapists are starting to do more manual treatment, um, which I do a lot of, which I think is helpful. Um, but specifically the Graston, I'm not certified in Graston, but I do oh, a very okay. similar, I do a very similar treatment using like a scraping tool. Okay. Um, and so the, the kind of way that I approach it and the idea behind some of these, like the Graston and these scrapey instruments is uh, specific to tendinopathy sort of things. Um, I use it on muscle tissue too, but I use it a lot for tendinopathies and going back to, I think what I had said before about a lot of these injuries are like degeneration of a tissue. And then as your body lays down new tissue, it doesn't always lay it down in the right patterns. Um, I think the best way to describe this, I learned this from a book by Jay Dachari. He wrote, he writes a lot of really great resources for runners um, and books. He developed the MOBO board, if people have heard of the MOBO board. But um, the way he describes this is like, if you take a pile of pickup sticks, there's a pile of sticks, and then you let the sticks, you, you stand them up on a table and then you let them go. Those sticks lay down all in all sorts of crisscrossy, disorganized patterns, if you will. And that's essentially what's happening in your body um, as it's trying to heal itself. So when your Achilles starts to have those tears and degenerations or your plantar fascia, and as the tissues laid down, it's laying down in that like disorganized way. So with the scrapey tool, what you're doing is you're trying to break up that tissue, um, break it up, break it up, break it up. You get some blood flow to the area, which is always good, especially for warming up a tissue. Um, and then once you do that, like when I do it in the clinic, I'll do that a bunch. And then I immediately have someone do exercises, um, especially eccentrics, because then you promote, um, those tissues to lay back down again, but in a uniform way Mm -hmm. is the theory, um, and the research behind it. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the point. That's why people take out these crazy scrapey things. I think (laughs) physical therapy is kind of funny. Like when people come into my clinic, I also do dry needling. So first I like poke them with a bunch of needles. And then I take out this like machete looking device and I scrape the crap. (laughs) I'm like, I promise all of these pokey scrapey things will make you feel better, but this like a torture chamber. (laughs) And I do realize that, (laughs) but it'll work. I promise. Um, so yeah, it's funny, but, uh, anyway, to answer your second question, 
Um, I definitely think it's something people can do at home. And actually I've talked to a few of my patients about buying an instrument and I teach them how to do it at home. Cause I, um, <laughs> I guess I have a funny business model in that I don't really want people to come see me. Like I want everyone to be healthy and come see me for some help and to get it figured out. But then let's teach you all these resources so that if, if it comes up or you need it, you know how to address it or use it as a preventative tool at mm. home. Um, and so I, I have someone buy a tool and then I teach them how to use it. But I will say, I think the important aspect of that is me teaching them how to use it. <laughs> right. That That's kind of, I think, what, what I had heard about not basically using it improperly could potentially be more harmful than helpful. Um, I didn't know all of what that would entail, but figured you might be more versed in, in that regard. Yeah, I think, I think where people can sometimes get those things wrong or maybe not use them correctly is, is some, is a lot of times just overdoing it. Uh, I've actually seen that with the massage guns. Like I've had people come in and they Mm. had like a bruise or a scab somewhere because they like massage gun too hard. I was like, Oh my gosh, I don't even know if I could tolerate doing that that hard to myself, but, um, yeah. And so it's, it's overdoing it. Like with those scrapey things, um, you definitely need a certain amount of pressure and you want to feel that you're, um, you know, scraping up some things, but you don't want to be like, you know, digging super hard and creating almost more trauma to the area. Cause we don't mm-hmm. want to create more trauma. Um, that's not good either. Uh, and that's true for anywhere, like in my Achilles or in my plantar fascia, you have to be careful around joints, um, too. You don't want to injure your joint doing something like that. So, and then there, that's why there's all these certification courses that professionals take like Graston. Um, cause there is a very sh- strategic way to use them or, uh, and there's research behind it and, um, they teach a very specific way to do it. And different muscles have their fibers aligned in different directions. And so, um, you know, the goal that the ideal way to use it is to really follow, um, the way that the, the muscles align and those tissue fibers are aligned. And so you would only, well, not would only, but you would know that by learning how to do it the correct way. Um, and also I, when I teach people how to use it, um, I tend to tell people to kind of, to scrape towards, uh, what I say is distal to proximal. So like starting from the joint away from you, or you start further away from you and you scrape towards you. And the only reason why I tell people to do that is because sometimes when you scrape, you're inducing this localized, um, like swelling response or inflammatory response. So if there's any swelling, ideally you want that swelling to be flushed into your lymphatic system. Um, I have, I I remember this patient one time who scraped his quad and he scraped it the other way and he went towards his knee. And then he said, all of a sudden at the end of the night or later that day, his knee got really swollen. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm not sure if it was exactly from the scraping, but if it was, I could see where, okay, well, you just induced a bunch of that to your, your quad. And then you went towards your knee. I, I'm curious if you had went the other way, if that would have still happened um, because of some of that like minor swelling response that can, that can happen. So there definitely is a finesse uh, to scraping, but I teach it to my patients all the time. And then once they learn how to do it, I actually think that's where um, I've been doing some telehealth or like consults recently too with patients. And that's something you can totally teach someone virtually. Um, the, the tools are pretty cheap. There's actually a company in Boulder called wave tool. Um, and they're fantastic. I, um, it's, it's a very similar instrument that has different edges and, and beveled components to it. Um, and it's a, it's a really, really great tool for runners, for climbers or whatever. Um, I, I send people to, to buy that. And then we have a, a telehealth conversation and we kind of go over how to use it, where to use it. And yeah, it can be really helpful. I think that as you kind of pointed to, I think the tough part is that like, and maybe this is a symptom of a type personalities, um, mm-hmm. you know, the people that get into competitive sports and can, you know, want to push and all those kind of things is the like more is better mentality. You know, it was like, you go, you go from let's work out really hard and put it like, I'm going to frame this in terms of runners, just because that's where I came from you know, let's put in all these miles and do all the speed work and do all the things. And now we've, you know, worked too hard and we've hurt ourselves because we did more is better. So 
let's take that same mentality let's go hard with the recovery and then let's just like do more and then that that's not good <laughs> so I, you know balance is hard I think is what I'm trying to get at um <laughs> if you're if if you don't know what you're doing and you're not being instructed or guided by somebody who does know what they're doing um I, I think it's hard to get away from that more is better mentality. Also, a little bit of the A-type personality thing, but also just like the the tendency to want to feel like I'm doing something, like like I can do something to make myself better, not just like I have to sit and wait because that feels almost like interminable. Yeah, I completely agree. And I'll be the first person to admit that I am a type A runner. <laughs> So I, I completely understand. Um, and I love the passion that comes with that. Like when people come in, they're like, all right, what can I do? I'm going to do all these exercises. You tell me times 10, I'm going to do times 20. <laughs> I got this. I'm going to do it. I'm right. going to do all my heart. And I love that passion. I love it. I love it. Um, it's, it's really helpful that people are so motivated. Um, but I agree with you. It's, it's hard. You know, I rarely tell an athlete um, or someone in my office to fully rest unless they absolutely have to like if it's a bad bony injury and we just need to like offload everything for a little bit um you know those cases but most of the time there there is always something that you can do um you know like working on mobility there's you know core exercises there's always because again going back to like well the whole system so you want to you know address these things while you're resting something else or offloading something else um so there is always something you can do, but to speak on what you just said, I do have the conversation often about, okay, I ask an athlete like, okay, well, what are you currently doing right now? What exercise are you doing? What, tell me all of it. And I have to have the conversation of like, whoa, I think we're doing too much. Like they're asking me what other exercises can I do? What, what other things should I be doing for my heel or my hip or whatever? And I sometimes have to be like, I think nothing. Like, I think you're a either doing enough or B, I think we just need to make it more efficient and tone it down. Um, because it's uh, sometimes it is like deloading a tissue. So it actually has time to recover. And then once that happens, now let's reload it in the appropriate way. Um, so it's an interesting conversation to have. It was, it was not something I talked about in other clinics that I worked in, but now working with runners and active people, it's like, okay, sometimes we have to, sometimes we have to do a little bit less. Um, and we don't realize like what's going on internally because we can't always feel it, but, but our body's like working so hard on the inside to, to do it. And we just have to trust the process, but it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. That does. I uh, just, I think anybody that has that, that tendency towards being active, putting in work, all those kind of things. And, and then to go, you also like, like in my case, I do, you know, three sets of 10 twice a day. It's not much. doesn't take long. And you go, well, yeah, it's, but it's not much. What else can I do? Like what it tendons just take time to adapt. Like there's, you can't, there's no rushing. It's just, it, it is what it is. Like your, your body's going to take time to adapt. And yeah. that's the tough part. It is. Um, and I will say to that too, I think, or initially, I think that that conversation too happens um, cause I'll admit it, it's happened with me. I think we get afraid of injury and that I would say more often that fear is coming from a fear of time away. Mm. We're not necessarily afraid of like my knee hurting cause, cause it's pain, but we know it's like not crazy detrimental or fatal or anything like that. Like it's not crazy severe, but I think what we're most afraid of is time away mm -hmm. because it, that's typically what an injury means is like, we get to run less or we, we do less of the activity that we love to do. Um, but I think injuries pop up for a reason and that's super cheesy, but I do think it's true. Like it's a, it's something telling you, okay, how, how is my training going right now? Or how, how is this activity fitting into my life? Maybe I need to adjust something. And it doesn't always necessarily mean adjusting something as it relates to movement and exercise and training, but like, okay, let me reflect. Am I sleeping well? Am I really stressed right now? Am I eating enough? Is my, is my nutrition going okay? Um, 
Is it my shoes? Did I just get it? Or, you know, what have you? Like, there's all of these different components. Um, it's not just like the physiological system, it's all of it. Uh, so I think there, there are opportunities to like, well, maybe I just need to step back and look at the full picture and like, okay, what can I, if I'm, th- if I'm trying to find something to do, maybe it's, oh, well, I just haven't been sleeping well, or I haven't been taking enough rest days, or I haven't been eating enough before I run or whatever. Um, so it's a good opportunity to do those things too. I want to switch before we run out of time. I want to switch a little bit of kind of hard juxtaposition here uh, and ask you about, um, so like on your uh, Instagram, you can see again, Boulder sports physio, um, uh, your pregnancy and postpartum exercise coach. Um, it, it's, it's on my mind uh, since we have a approaching two month old baby now. Oh, um, obviously I did not have that baby, but my wife did. <laughs> Um, and eventually she'll be, you know, getting back to being active. And so I'm just curious about what that means for you and your practice, how you kind of approach that situation. And are there any typicals, um, for women postpartum trying to get back into exercise or is it really just a case by case situation? Yeah. Well, uh, congratulations again to you guys. You. That's really exciting. Um, yeah. So I, I've loved the certification. I got it this year actually. Um, and I, I do want to say I'm not, so there are like pelvic floor physical therapists that actually get a separate certification and can do internal exams. And I suggest most runners, actually, you do not have to go through pregnancy or postpartum or anything to, to consider physical, uh, pelvic floor physical therapy, but it is something to my, my pre and postpartum runners, um, I think it's, you definitely should check in um, because there's muscles that are internal that affect our hip stability and our core. And you can even get like, it can go down to your foot. You'll develop plantar fasciitis if there's a dysfunction up there. So um, I think it's it's definitely worth a visit there um, or to a pelvic floor specific physical therapist. But how I use my certification, I got it because um, I think there's a lot of myths with pre and being pre and pregnant and postpartum. Um, And there's still information to be learned about that, but it's uh, the myths around it are that you like shouldn't do a lot of things or there's maybe a lot of stigma in someone who continues to run through pregnancy or they bounce back to activity quicker than somebody else. And there's stigma with that. Um, I think there's also a lot of comparison going on and Um, this pressure for these individuals to get back to where they were or to get back to a certain body type or a certain performance level. Um, And and really it has to be an individual basis. Like everyone experiences pregnancy so different. I have not been pregnant yet, but I've had a bajillion friends get pregnant and deliver. And I'm like, oh my gosh, everyone was so different. There's really no way you can predict how it's going to go. Um, but I, I want to help empower women athletes in this phase because I think there's a fear of not being able to run again or not being strong again. And, um, you know, after you deliver, after you have a baby, it's, it's a lot that your body goes through, but I equate it to, um, cause the rule right now is that you take six weeks, like completely off after you deliver a baby, which I do think rest is needed for sure. However, um, now that you have this baby, like you're still active, like you are picking this baby up and down, you are doing all this other stuff. So if you don't do any sort of like core retraining, um, you have to do that in this time as well, which will help you as you return to running. So, um, I, I am trying to help women kind of feel uh, maybe into the point of like, there's always something you can do, but like, you know, you can start those things now and feel strong now. And, um, I think starting those exercises, cause I think what I've seen other women do is, um, they wait the six weeks. Cause I'd probably be this person too, just, uh, admitting you wait the six weeks and at six to eight weeks, your doctor says you're good. And you're like, all right, I'm gonna start running again, but you've done nothing else. It's kind of like, if you had surgery and you waited the eight weeks, whatever. And the doctor was like, things are healed. You're good to go. And then you just tried to start running after surgery, like no one does that. Um, well, I'm sure important. people try, but it doesn't, people I, wouldn't, try. I, mean, I wouldn't guess that it goes very well. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, 
it, like I used to work in the hospital. I used to work at Boulder Community uh, Hospital as a PT there. And like people get their knees replaced and you're getting them out of bed two hours later. Like they're the, you can, you can start to strengthen the body or even do prehab, which is another thing too, for, for women who are currently pregnant or thinking about, there's like all these things you can do before to keep muscles really strong before you deliver. Um, so, so yeah, I, I just, I think there's a lot of myth. I think there's a lot of pressure. Um, and I just want to help empower women. Like there are so many things you can do and you can, you can start sooner than later, even just doing some of the maybe more simple kind of minimal things of like floor exercises, um, and get back into running safely. Uh, cause also no, no one really wants to go through like, well, I got back into running and now I'm can't run again because my hip is killing me or whatever it is. And, um, I think for, for women and when we have kids for men and women, I, I, men go through the, the birthing process and having a baby, like they go through a lot too. Um, those outlets are still needed for sanity and stress relief. Like we still want to be active. We still want to go for a run. And I think those things are possible, but, um, I just want to help empower people to understand like how that process can go and, um, that you can stay strong during and after. Um, so before we run out of time, uh, ask everybody the same question each season of the show. So I'll ask you this season's questions now. Um, and that question is, how do you celebrate your wins? <gasps> Ooh, how do I celebrate my wins? I celebrate them in a variety of ways. Um, I, oh gosh, I love this question. Um, hmm. I guess I usually celebrate them, um, like with friends and family, um, celebrating, celebrating those wins. And, uh, I, I'm not someone that like likes attention, but I do think that it's important to recognize when you have accomplished something or like, oh my gosh, yes, this was a goal. I deserve to like treat myself, uh, however that may be. Um, and so, uh, taking that time, taking that time for me, whatever that may be again, like maybe that's treat myself to a fancy dinner or whatever that may be. Um, I think it's important that way um, to celebrate to celebrate wins and give yourself a pat on the back. Uh, but I don't think I have a go-to. Um, even in, I, huh, I'm a runner and I have only like won one race. I got first place in this uh, trail race I did a few years ago and it was awesome. Um, and to celebrate, celebrate that one, I just like uh, told everyone I knew about it because like, I was just so proud of myself that like, you guys, I won this race. I like put it on Instagram or whatever. And I think it's okay to like, just shout out loud about yourself every once in a while. Uh, Cause you deserve it. That's a good answer. I'm glad, I'm glad you got multiple ways to celebrate your wins. So <laughs> it's, it stumped some people, which is why I asked the question. I think it's something. Yeah. It um, stumped me at should, first. We should probably spend more time doing so. Yeah. Um, Sarah, if people want to reach out, see see what you're up to, find you, talk to you, any of that kind of stuff, where can they do that? Yeah, uh, people can, you've already mentioned uh, my Instagram at Boulder Sports, at uh, Boulder Sports Physio with underline. underscores. With other underscores and things. Yeah, um, people can find me on there. Um, they can also reach out to me um, in a message through there too. My email is bouldersportsphysio at gmail.com and people are more than welcome to email me anytime. I always, I feel like I say this on, a, on every podcast or whatever, but I really love being a resource. And so anyone is more than welcome to reach out anytime. Um, my website is also bouldersportsphysio.com um, and you can contact me through there and learn more about me. Um, but yeah, those are probably the best ways. Awesome. Thanks for hanging out with me today, Sarah. Yeah, Jesse, thank you for having me. This has been really fun.